I'd like to thank CAFRA for organizing this event and for the opportunity to share our experiences as advocates of tobacco harm reduction, particularly our continuing advocacy for a risk-proportionate regulation of alternative nicotine products here in the Philippines. As a quick introduction, I am Joey Dulay, President of the Philippine E-Cigarette Industry Association, or PESIA. PESIA is the largest e-cigarette trade industry organization in the Philippines, composed of store owners, suppliers, and manufacturers of electronic cigarettes as members. Since our founding in 2013, we have been actively engaging our legislators both in the lower and upper chamber of the Philippine Congress, as well as our regulators from the Department of Health and our local Food and Drug Administration Agency for the passage of a law and regulation that will reasonably and effectively regulate alternative nicotine products in the Philippines. So for today, with our experiences in lobbying in Congress, attending public consultations and engaging our policy makers as well as facing the anti-vaping groups in the Philippines, we thought of sharing with you the lessons that we have learned so far in our continuing journey of advocating for risk proportionate regulation of alternative nicotine products in our country. We have here 10 guiding principles that we believe that are helpful in our engagement especially with our legislators in Congress. These are the fundamental principles that have been guiding us in PESIA in order to ensure that we are conveying the right messages and arguments to achieve a risk-proportionate regulation of alternative nicotine products in our country. Principle number one, not all nicotine products are the same. The first guiding principle in our experience is very important to ensure that any discussion on how to regulate alternative nicotine products will move forward. Legislators and policymakers should understand that while all nicotine products should be regulated, they should not be regulated the same way. Rather, there is a continuum of risk among nicotine-containing products, ranging from cigarettes, which are the most dangerous due to the combustion of tobacco, to alternative nicotine products such as snooze, heated tobacco products, and e-cigarettes, which provide a significant reduction in risk compared to cigarettes. Products that do not burn tobacco or generate smoke are placed on the lower range of the spectrum of risks because science indicates they are less harmful than continued smoking. By adjusting regulation to the actual risk profile of the tobacco or nicotine product, regulators will be able to optimize the potential benefits of alternative nicotine products for current smokers. Principle number two, regulation is not just about control, it is also about facilitation. The second principle is an important reminder especially to regulators. It is usually forgotten that regulation has two important dimensions. One is control and the other is facilitation. Obviously, among anti-tobacco groups, the control aspect of regulation has been the favorite tool in addressing the public health consequences of smoking cigarettes. Thus, we are not surprised that the banning of cigarettes, including alternative nic nicotine products, has been supported by the public health sector because this is the best way to control a problem. Simply ban it or make it impossible to exist. Vaping is also dangerous and I am banning it. And if you are smoking now, you will be arrested. But what has been missing is the facilitation aspect of smoking regulation. How do we effectively facilitate current smokers to quit smoking? What are the other potential approaches that can help facilitate the rapid decrease of smoking prevalence in one country? The key insight is that, despite good intentions, too much control in the field of tobacco control can have exactly the opposite of the effect intended. It can protect the cigarette trade, support the tobacco industry, and promote smoking. Principle number three, excessive regulation will lead to more smoking. The Royal College of Physicians has highlighted how excessively burdensome regulation, including prohibition applied to alternative nicotine products such as e-cigarettes, can actually lead to more smoking. However, if a risk-averse precautionary approach also makes e-cigarettes less easily accessible, less palatable or acceptable, more expensive, less consumer-friendly or pharmacologically less effective, or inhibits innovation and development of new and improved products, then it causes harm by perpetuating smoking. Getting this balance right is difficult. 
Risk proportionate regulations resolves the regulator's dilemma. The question for regulators is how to achieve the balance mentioned by the Royal College of Physicians. Given this is a treacherous landscape in which a regulation can work in the opposite way to that intended. The answer is to use risk proportionate regulation that means the strength of regulation should be proportionate to the risk the product poses to users with the aim of encouraging migration from high risk to low risk products. Principle number four, sound science should provide the basis for regulations and standards on alternative nicotine products. The fourth principle advocates for a science-based and evidence-based regulation. Legislators and regulators should take a dispassionate view of scientific arguments and not accept or promote flawed media or activist misinterpretations of data. For example, much has been made about gateway effects, in which use of low-risk products would, it claimed, lead to use of high-risk smoke products. We all know that there is dirt of any credible evidence that supports this conjecture. What government regulators should instead remember is that scientific research will be increasingly essential to the development and implementation of effective and workable regulatory policies for overseeing all tobacco, nicotine, and alternative products and the development of lower risk products. Principle number five, innovation and technology must be encouraged to develop lower risk nicotine products. The fifth principle calls for an open mind about the potential for new technologies and innovations that can help people stop smoking. As what is happening in other sectors like the fossil fuel industry, new technology and innovation should be encouraged and supported in both the private and public health sectors. Historically, established industries have been transformed or eliminated when innovation flourishes. Innovation in the form of novel nicotine delivery devices and in the application of technology to mitigate the problem of combustible smoke tobacco use and nicotine dependence must be actively encouraged in both the private and public health sectors. If there are tax incentives for manufacturing cleaner fossil fuels, there should be also incentives to producing low-risk nicotine products. Principle number six, people who don't quit smoking should be incentivized to switch to alternative nicotine products. Regulators can implement policies to encourage adult smokers who would not otherwise quit to switch completely to less risky products. Regulators in the UK and New Zealand have already taken steps in this direction. In order to accelerate switching to less harmful alternatives and encourage further innovation, regulations of tobacco and nicotine products should number one, require appropriate warnings that reflect the risk profile of different categories of products. Number two, allow some freedoms for communicating about alternative nicotine products. Number three, allow the use of flavors in alternative nicotine products because a ban on flavors would only shift consumers to unsafe and unchecked black market products. Number four, set lower taxation for smoke-free alternatives. And number five, allow greater freedom to use alternative nicotine products in places where cigarette smoking is prohibited. Principle number seven, citizens have the right to receive truthful and non-misleading information about alternative nicotine products. People who smoke will only switch to less harmful alternatives if they know about them and understand their risks relative to cigarettes and other combustible products. Truthful information can be a powerful incentive to propel smokers to switch from the most dangerous tobacco products to lower risk alternatives. In contrast, keeping adult smokers in the dark or providing them incorrect or misleading information about smoke-free alternatives will prevent smokers from making better choices and will prolong the smoking epidemic. Regulatory policies play a critical role in ensuring the free flow of truthful and non-misleading information to consumers. Principle number eight, novel nicotine products should meet minimum but reasonable product standards. Given the multitude of technologies and product variants in this area, we support the idea that setting minimum but reasonable product standards for new tobacco and nicotine products is critical. Product standards would serve several important goals including assuring that the alternative nicotine products are better alternatives to continuing smoking, 
creating credibility for and confidence in new products among consumers, regulators, and the public health community, and ensuring new products do not pose any immediate safety or quality concern when used as intended. Principle number nine, the use of alternative nicotine products should be closely monitored in order to address unintended consequences. Alternative nicotine products should only be marketed to adult smokers who do not intend to quit and want to continue to consume nicotine. At the same time, we must acknowledge that some youth or non-smokers could begin to use these alternatives. But what needs to be done is not to ban or over-regulate these products because of this potential unintended consequence. Instead, robust post-market surveillance of the use of alternative nicotine products is needed to monitor whether and to what extent they are being used by people for whom they are not intended. Those studies should be conducted transparently and shared among all stakeholders in order to facilitate an open dialogue on the additional steps or policies that could be undertaken to prevent unintended use, especially by minors. Principle number 10. Stakeholder consultation is an important tool when crafting the rules and guidelines that will govern alternative nicotine products. The central objective of regulatory policy is ensuring that regulations are designed and implemented in the public interest. It can only be achieved with full participation of those concerned and impacted by the regulations. Regulators should provide regular opportunities, both formally and informally, for stakeholders to voice their questions, concerns, and recommendations regarding proposed regulatory policies and the implementation of those policies. Finally, we understand that the goal of tobacco control is complex and challenging. It is also achievable, but only if all parties, including regulators, consumers, researchers, product manufacturers, and the public health community are included in the debate and are committed to fairly and transparently engaging with one another regarding the policies that can ultimately propel innovation and alter consumer behavior to benefit public health. These are the 10 guiding principles that PCA rely on and that we are happy that we were able to share them to you today. Thank you very much again to Kafra for this opportunity. Stay safe, everyone.